jump through really Genesis 42 and 43, not looking at every single verse, but big chunks of this. Have you ever had a surprise check come in the mail that you were not expecting? Yep. I've actually had a over the years. Sometimes they're like a gift. Sometimes it's just like a rebate or a refund or, you know, something like that. And you're like, oh, I didn't know that. Okay, great. Right? How do you feel when you suddenly get surprised by a, a, a check? Yeah, it's good, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, unfortunately, there are some times where I don't always feel good. Sometimes I feel suspicious, right? Have you ever gotten a check and you're like, wait, what's this for? Uh, I've heard of like scams where it's like you endorse the check and then next thing you know, like bad things start happening. Uh, you, it's, you've signed a contract. So I always flip over the check and look at the little fine print on the back. That's probably being way too suspicious, right? But the other day we got a, a, a check back from a medical procedure from like two years ago. And it's like, oh, here's $87. Why? Like, I want, I want an explanation, not just a check. Right? I, I, just, I just struggle to go, okay, that, that's good. I, I'll take that. So sometimes there's, there's a catch and sometimes I'm a little hesitant. Um, sometimes when I get unexpected money, I go, God, why are you doing this? Like, am I going to need this? for something that you know about that I don't know about yet. Did you ever kind of have a conversation like that? Like, oh boy, here comes a blessing, but that means <laughs> you start bracing yourself for a hard time, and that can be tough. I think sometimes we do struggle to trust God's blessing because, well, sometimes we get in a, in a routine where we're just kind of waiting for the other shoe to drop. Do you ever find yourself just waiting for the other shoe to drop? Yeah. So maybe we need to spend less time trying to figure out what God's angle is <laughs> and just try to trust Him, that He's good. I mean, we know intellectually that is true, I think. We look at Scripture and we go, God is good. There's no evil in Him. There's no shifting shadow. He doesn't have an angle. But He does know everything that's coming. And so sometimes God is working ahead on our behalf. Our own sinfulness, I think, sometimes can be part of what causes us to brace for things, right? Um, it can cause us to go, mm, I, I think I've got something coming that I actually deserve. And so we get a little, you know, have you ever seen a, a dog or a cat that knows they did the wrong thing and now they're, you know, like they, don't, they, they know something bad's about to happen. Right? And I think sometimes we can kind of feel that way, and, and I don't think we're alone. In fact, as we look at the, the story of Joseph continue to unfold here, we're going to see that kind of going on in, in two different sides of this equation. Um, because God's going to bring Joseph and his brothers back together, and so you have kind of this flashback for both of them to, hey, some bad stuff went down a while ago, and now what? So, if you, if you didn't get there yet, Genesis 42, and, and just to refresh your memory, I'm going to give us a little summary of what's been happening in, in Joseph, just in case you maybe missed the message or haven't gone through and read Genesis. So, uh, so Joseph starts off, very young man, very honored, favored by his father. His, there, there's, there's two wives, really, for, for uh, his dad, and they have multiple children, and, and Dad loves jo Joseph's mom the most, right? And so he and his brother Benjamin are definitely favorites. And, uh, and, and so they're, they're treated special, they're given special privileges, and Joseph ends up having a dream that one day all of his family is going to come bow down to him. And then, like a youngest brother, he goes and tells his oldest brothers that that's what's going to happen. And, uh, and they don't appreciate that at all. And... Uh, and here's one of the things. Whenever somebody says, God said this is going to happen, the best thing you can do is wait and see. Right? I mean, either they're going to be proven wrong or they're going to be proven right. Right? These brothers, the best advice they could have gotten is just say, hey, sit tight and let's see if you end up bowing down to him. Because here's the thing. They go and they try to interrupt this plan that God has shown Joseph. They're like, we're going to stop that. We're going to prevent that. Now, have you ever tried to prevent what God is going to do? That never goes well, right? And meanwhile, if they would have just been able to be patient, and let's wait and see. 
Well, they, they could have not been the villains of this story if they could have been a little patient and just kind of held on. So instead, they fake his death, they sell him into slavery, and then they're like, ha, we'll see if God can fulfill that dream now. And of course, God will fulfill that dream anyway. Um, so there's nothing they could do to stop it. Their anger towards Joseph was so great, though, and, and I think this can happen to anybody. We can become so consumed or obsessed with something, so angry about something, that we begin to ignore those obvious truths, right? If this is something God has set in motion, there's not anybody that's going to stop it. Not us, not anybody. But they, they're, they're angry and they're rageful and they're going to intervene. And, 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 God, and, and that hardens their hearts so much that even when they see their father mourning for years the loss of their brother, even for years they're watching him them mourn, and they still don't confess what's actually happened. I mean, they could have said, hey, Dad, we really, we really messed this one up. But you know what? We're all going to go to Egypt, and we're just going to look for him. And maybe we can find him. Right? There, there were ways they could have tried to straighten it out or confess, but they don't. So God has used all of this in Joseph's life, and, and it's now been about 20 years since his brothers turned on him. 20 years. And over that time, Joseph has been through a lot of ups and downs, and he's learned to trust God in the midst of it. And now he's ended up the second most powerful person in Egypt. Second only to Pharaoh. And finally, Joseph's childhood vision is about to take place. Because Joseph interpreted Pharaoh's dream about the impending famine... God is going to use him to save not only his immediate family, but, but tons of people and the generations that would come after his family in Egypt. And, uh, and so as famine grips the world, Egypt and their storehouses become a beacon of hope calling out to a world in need. Even though we're not going to read all the scriptures in these two chapters, um, we have to read verse 1 because it's, it's a funny verse. If, you, if you're there, look at it with me here. Genesis 42.1, Jacob saw that there was grain in Egypt, and Jacob said to his sons, why are you staring at one another? We're starving over here. Like, we're either going to die, or you're going to go to Egypt and go get grain. Get on your camels. Let's go. Get this train moving. Right? I mean, it's like, if you ever, as, as a parent, have you ever sat there and gone, anybody home? I mean, these are fully adult men, and he's going... Get out of here. So uh, he, he spells it out for them and sends his sons, except Benjamin, Joseph's only full brother, because he cannot bear the thought of anything happening to him. So he sends the other ten, says, go get grain. Verse 6. Now Joseph was the ruler over the land, and he was the one who sold all to all the people of the land. And Joseph's brothers came and bowed down to him with their faces to the ground. They have no idea this is Joseph. Okay. When Joseph saw his brothers, he recognized them, but he disguised himself to them and spoke to them harshly. And he said to them, where have you come from? And they said, from the land of Canaan to buy food. Now, this is a very interesting scene to me because at this point, Joseph has literally nothing to fear, like physical harm from these brothers. He's got literally armies at his disposal. So it's not like he's like shaking his boots like they're going to hurt me. He's probably got guards in the room that would kill them in a, with a snap of his fingers. But I don't think he, he doesn't want to get played again, right? He wants to see what's happened, and there's probably a lot of stuff stirred up in him. I mean, these are the brothers that sold you down the river, quite literally. And they're not going to be able to hurt him, but it, he's still probably hurt, understandably. And I think, like, honestly, this is the fulfillment of the dream right here. This is happening, and I think it would have been really tempting, at least for me, to go, Ha! I told you! I told you! And he doesn't. Instead, Joseph's got a little bit of fear himself um, to trust the people that hurt him. And even though his, this is clearly his God moment, instead of embracing them, Joseph decides to test them. And four times, Joseph goes through and accuses them of being spies. And to convince them that they are not, him that they are not spies, they begin to divulge all sorts of personal information about themselves. 
they, they confess that they're all brothers. They, they admit that there are 12 of them, but one is back with dad and one is dead now. Joseph knows that his brothers have lied before. In fact, they don't technically know that he's dead. They're, they're, still, they're still playing that ruse, in a sense, by saying, and one of them's dead. So he decides to test them in their truth-telling before he reveals himself to them. And even though Joseph is talking harshly, the big picture of this passage begins to indicate very quickly that he does not actually want to harm his brothers. In fact, we'll see what his desire is, is to bless them. In verse 14, Joseph said to them, It is as I said to you, your spies. By this you will be tested. By the life of Pharaoh, you shall not go from this place unless your youngest brother comes here. Send one of you that he may get your brother while you remain confined that your words may be tested, whether there is truth in you. But if not, by the life of Pharaoh, surely you are spies. So he put them all together in prison for three days. Now, Joseph said to them on the third day, this is verse 18, Do this and live, for I fear God. If you are honest men, let one of your brothers be confined in in your prison. But as for the rest of you, Go carry grain for the famine of your households and bring your youngest brother to me so your words may be verified and you will not die. And they did so. Now, notice it's interesting that the first thing Joseph was going to do is just let one of them return to go get Benjamin. That's it. And then after he puts him in the prison for three days, um, he reconsiders some things and he realizes that their families need food. And, And so he sends all of them but one. And I think the question Joseph is kind of asking there inadvertently is, are you going to turn on one brother? Right? So they leave Simeon in prison because they have no choice. But what you have to understand for these brothers how desperate this situation is for them. They know how protective dad is of Benjamin. He wouldn't allow Benjamin on this trip. And now they have to go back and convince dad to send a Benjamin to save Simeon. They might, and I think they recognize this, literally be saying their final goodbyes to Simeon as they leave Egypt. And desperation is what finally causes them to now, in the midst of this decision, to discuss their 20-year-old secret that's been haunting them. Finally getting real. In verse 21, it says, They said to one another, Truly, we're guilty concerning our brother, because we saw the distress of his soul when he pleaded with us, yet we would not listen. Therefore, this distress has come upon us. Reuben answered them, saying, Did I not tell you, do not sin against the boy? And you would not listen. Now comes the reckoning for his blood. They are finally broken. They are desperate. But instead of being able to see that God is for them, they feel like God is against them. Have you ever felt like God is against you? That is a horrible, horrible feeling. It's a horrible place to be. As they're discussing this, thinking that they're having a private conversation because they're speaking in Hebrew and assuming that Joseph does not know Hebrew and that he has no idea what they're saying, he's actually moved to tears and has to leave the room. They're finally being real and honest. And so even though he's still going to test them by keeping Simeon in jail, he begins to bless them. And he loads them up with all the grain that they've requested, along with extra provisions for their trip. And without their knowledge, he gives them all of their money back as well. That, that check in the mail that you're going, I don't know about this. Right? So even as Joseph tries to bless them, they become very suspicious and concerned with this extra blessing. Look at verse 26. So they loaded their donkeys with grain and departed from there, and one of them opened his sack to give his donkey fodder at the lodging place, and he saw his money, and behold, it was in the mouth of his sack. 
And he said to his brothers, My money has been returned, and behold, it's even in my sack. And their hearts sank. And they turned trembling to one another, saying, What is it that God has done to us? That's like the biblical version of saying, We are so screwed. He got his, they, got, they got their money back, and, and instead of seeing that as a, prov- a provision and a blessing from God, they're assuming this is a setup. Now, why would someone assume that? A guilty conscience? Yeah? You know, they say that the person most concerned with someone stealing from them is a thief. The person most obsessed with catching someone in a lie is probably a liar. These brothers have set up and mistreated people over and over in the course of their life. More than just Joseph. And it seems like now they can't, they can't relax, right? There's, there's somebody out to get them around every corner. And when they get home and start telling dad everything, the, the, the concern grows. Because they start getting into the rest of their grain and discover that literally everyone's money has been returned. It wasn't just one bag that had money in it, but all of them. And like literally panic sets in for the whole family. They've been given a huge blessing And they can't see it that way. They only see a curse. Even dad is in that camp. His issue isn't the same as theirs, but it's kind of trauma related too. In verse 36 it says, Their father Jacob said to them, You have bereaved me of my children. Joseph is no more. Simeon is no more. And now you would take Benjamin... All these things are against me. So his grief over Joseph and now Simeon and the potential of Benjamin has blinded him to God's blessing. What he doesn't understand is things are not always as they appear. Have you ever had that where things are not really the way they look? Right? It looks bad, but all of a sudden it turns really good. That's what's about to happen here. Instead of another loss, literally what they're on the cusp of is a huge family reunion where the dead are brought back to life. I mean, that's basically what's going to happen. There's going to be sweet reunion, restoration, in a way that only God could accomplish, and yet they're still bracing for impact. Knowing that the survival of the entire family rests on Jacob's decision, dad's decision, regarding Benjamin, you've got Reuben and then Judah take turns going in to try to convince their father that Benjamin has to go with them to get Simeon back and to get more grain. And literally the decision gets kicked down the road until they run out of food again. This is a hard choice. And Jacob finally begrudgingly relents. And in order to make sure that this meeting goes more smoothly, they take the original money, they're going to bring it back, and then all new money. Like these guys are loaded. Like they needed an armor vehicle for this trip, for sure. So they have tons of money. They're going, we're going we're gonna to make, we're going to get everything set right, Dad. Don't worry. We will work this out. We will bring Benjamin back to you. Promise. So they're going to go in and tangle with this ruler from Egypt and his crazy demands. And then Joseph becomes even more generous. And it becomes more disturbing for them. Verse 16, When Joseph saw Benjamin was with him, with them, uh, he said to his house steward, Bring the men into the house and slay an animal and make ready, for the men are to dine with me at noon. Verse 17, So the man did as Joseph said and brought the men to Joseph's house. Now the men were afraid 
because they were brought to Joseph's house and they said, it's because of the money that was turned in our sacks the first time that we're being brought in that he may seek occasion against us and fall upon us and take us for slaves with our donkeys. Yeah, because Joseph needed their donkeys. Right? So they've been invited into a meal with the number two guy in all of Egypt. Instead of being honored, they're terrified. Desperate for some way out, they begin to plead with Joseph's head guy. Verse 19, So they came near to Joseph's house steward and spoke to him at the entrance of the house and said, Oh my Lord, we indeed came down the first time to buy food. And it came about that when we came to the lodging place, we opened our sacks and behold, each man's money was in the mouth of his sack, our money in full. So we've brought it back in our hand. So they're like, oh, if this is the issue, we just want to smooth this out. We've also brought down other money in our hands to buy food again. We do not know who put the money in our sacks. And then the steward tries to ease their fears. If only they could have heard him, they would have been overjoyed. But something is yet blocking their ears. Verse 23, it says, he, he says to them, be at ease. Do not be afraid. Your God and the God of your fathers has given your treasure in your sacks. I had your money. Then he brought Simeon out to them. Then the man brought the men into Joseph's house and gave them water. And they washed their feet and he gave their donkeys fodder. Like, this is first class tourism right here. Right? He tells them not to be afraid. He evokes the name of their God. He tells them that he had their money. No worries. He returns Simeon to them. He brings them into the house. They wash their feet. They get all cleaned up. He feeds the donkeys. They still can't relax. Something bad is going to happen. We just know it. It's got to be a trap. So when Joseph appears, they bow before him again, trembling. Now, if he doesn't say gotcha this time, I mean, when are you going to do it? Meanwhile, Joseph simply wants to know if they and their families are doing well. He even blesses his brother Benjamin in the name of their God. At which point he is overcome by emotion and has to leave the room in tears. With all of this kindness, why can't they receive it? They mistakenly believe Joseph is against them despite his kindness. And more importantly, I think this is the real issue. They believe God is against them. They believe God is in opposition to them. And there's no way out for them. When you believe you deserve punishment, what are you bracing for? Punishment. Right? There was no worse punishment in my home than when mom would say, We're going to wait till your dad gets home. Because then you spent the whole day going, This is going to be so bad. And I don't remember which one of us it was, but there was one time somebody piled on the underwear like many layers. <laughs> bracing for punishment. <laughs> I think my dad started laughing when he saw him because <laughs> it was so obvious. <laughs> uh, but these brothers have spent 20 years bracing for impact. I mean, that, that goes back to Reuben's speech. I told you this was coming. We are in such deep trouble now. Because they know what they deserve. When you believe God is against you and out to get you, how are you going to live? I, I think the natural thing is, like, like a dog or a cat, you're going to avoid contact. Right? You're dodgy. You're going to believe that anything that bad that happens is because you deserve it, and anything that good that happens is just a setup. And that's where these brothers are at. They're just trying to get out of there because no matter how good it seems, they know what they deserve. 
And once Joseph sees their remorse and their humility and their brokenness, he gushes all over them. In this way, Joseph gives us a glimpse at the heart of God. Because God will allow us to be tested, sure. He will let us face hard times. But ultimately, God's desire is to bless us because He loves us. And if you've ever felt like God was against you, I want you to hear these words today from Romans chapter 8, verse 31 and 32. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? This is how much we know God is for us. Listen to verse 32. He who did not spare His own Son, but delivered Him over for all of us, how will He not also with Him freely give us all things? We might be in a place where we're timid and afraid to trust God. Maybe that is where you're at. But God shows us ridiculous, ridiculous grace and lavishes us with salvation that Christ purchased for us on the cross. Dying in our place. Like you look at this picture of what Joseph does for these brothers, that doesn't even touch the tip of the iceberg of what God has done for you and I. Even when we were yet in our sin, Christ died for us. We serve a God who loves us and wants to redeem everything in our lives. He is a God that works all things together for good, right? He loves us and wants us to succeed in doing right. He wants us to trust Him, but so many times instead of embracing Him, embracing His love, embracing His grace, we become avoidant. And instead of running to Him, we're running away from Him. It's possible that sometimes we get the wrong impression of God. Right? Maybe we see Him as vengeful. God is just. And, and, and so then sometimes we start to go, okay, well, once I prove myself, I just have to prove myself. I just, I just need to be good. I need to be have my good outweigh my bad. Once my life's in order, which it never will be, then I'm going to go to Him. But God is not waiting for us to fix ourselves. He's not. He's only waiting for us to humble ourselves. That's all He's waiting on. So why do we look at things that go wrong in life and feel like God hates us? Why do we look at a bad medical diagnosis and assume that God is out to get us? Why do we look at a bad financial situation and jump to the conclusion that, that God has abandoned us? I think it's often because just like these brothers, we can't see God's mercy because of our sin. We, we become resistant to God's grace because we believe our sin is too great. And if we're honest, we do deserve punishment. We do deserve for God to oppose us. It would be natural for Him to punish us to condemn us, but He doesn't want to. That is such good news. Such good news. He'd rather bless us if we will run to Him. He is ready and waiting to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What a miraculous gift that is. So today, it's my prayer that for any of us that may be in a situation where we feel like, man, I just can't trust God yet, that we begin to see in this picture that Joseph paints, his life paints for us, 
that we don't need to run away. We don't need to hide. We can go to God. Our sin, yes, it's offensive, but God will, God will remove it and cast it as far as the east is from the west when we humble ourselves and turn to Him. So if you're out there going, I feel like, man, I feel like I'm just waiting for the other shoe to drop. God's out to get me. He's not. He's not. He wants you to run to Him. There is nothing that you can have done. Nothing which God's grace is unable to cover. And you might say, well, Dan, you don't know. No, when I said nothing, I mean nothing. You could be a mass murderer. God's grace is sufficient. We can turn to Him. We can run to Him. His grace is always greater than sin. And the sooner we understand that and we begin to see that God's desire is to redeem and to heal and to bless, the sooner we will run to the only one who can save us. So we need to realize that the Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, and abounding in loving kindness. We need to learn to trust Him in the good and the bad. Lord God, I pray that You would have met someone here today who's going, yeah, I do feel like God's out to get me. That You would have met them in that moment. Your Holy Spirit would prick their heart and You would draw them closer to You. And for all of us, Lord, that we would take just another step in trusting You. Not being skittish <laughs> or running from You or hiding. That we would run to You and trust Your hand of blessing. Knowing that You are working all things together for good. It may not look good in this moment, but we can trust You. And we can wait. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to close out with Blessed Be Your Name. This is one of my favorite, one of my favorite songs. Because it talks about we're going to, you can stand. We're going we're gonna to trust God in the good and in the bad. And sometimes it's easier to trust God in the bad than the good. But we've got we to gotta bless his name and trust him in both. Let's sing it out. <laughs>